Hello, good folks. Welcome to House of Decline. This week, uh, several very funny things happened. Several very funny things happened. But the funny thing that happened most funny is perhaps the mass uh, recognizance of the Black Hammer organization and its uh, wondrous leader, Ghazi. As always, uh, we have Steven with us. Hi, ho. And Steven, in his engineering capabilities, has now devised a way that we can play clips on the show. We can and play so to clips. Com- yeah, we got we can play clips, and they're going to be crystal clear and yeah. sound quality. And mm. to celebrate this, we have to play the funniest thing that I've heard this year. Um, it's it's. I hope this Black Hammer thing becomes a thing. Uh, play 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 the audio, Steven. Okay. Hello, Antifa. <laughs> it's me, Ghazi, the Commander-in-Chief of the Black Hammer Organization. Land back! Land back! Land back! Land back! I heard you had some not-so-nice things to say about me. I heard you had some nice things to say about my hammers. Mm. I heard you had not-so-nice things to do to one of my members. One of my dear, dear members, an African Filipino mother that you doxxed and thought you could get away with it, thought we were gonna back down, thought we were gonna take it. And no, that's not gonna happen. You messed with the wrong one this time. Yes, so oh yes, you did. Oh, yes, you did. Cause we don't take it lightly <laughs> when harm is done. To our African colonized women. Okay. You need to see the video accompanying with this to get the whole idea. But Ghazi is the leader of this group of um, black nationalist uh, communists, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. That's sort of like the best way to describe what hammers are. They're black nationalist um, uh, uh, communists. And their goal is to start a city in the middle of the desert called Hammer City, which is a place for all people of color to be free and without persecution of uh, white people. Uh, which is, you know, fair. But <laughs> there's also, there there's, the, the Ghazi has been on YouTube for a while. And as you can hear from the audio, they're very funny and very charismatic and very understanding of how to uh, use PR to get attention. Yeah, he's been Joker-fied also. Is a, yeah. I mean, that's the main thing. I thought you were going to go there first. He's wearing Joker makeup. Uh, You're right. I, I completely <laughs> missed out the part. They're wearing Joker makeup. I, I also think Ghazi is a non-binary person as well. So uh, there's a lot of queer inflection in their, their, their okay. pansexual non-binary person. There's so a lot they, of queer yeah, inflection wearing, in there. They are wearing Joker yes. makeup. Uh um, but yeah, they, they've become fully Jokerified, fully black Joker, lost in space. Um, and it's funny that they're using that aesthetic, you know, because I usually the Joker I associate with disturbed white people. So mm-hmm. it's very funny that they're taking on that mantle and how culturally relevant the Joker movie has become to the idea of oppressed peoples taking back their right. uh, identity, you know, taking back their their birthright. Right. Right, and he, uh, they talk about it in a different video about um, appropriation versus assimilation, which is an interesting mm-hmm. uh, thing that they point out um, in a video called D- Dear White Feminists, Black Women Are Busy. Um, I can just play the beginning of it because it is very funny. Okay, do you guys? So I'm sitting over here learning Igbo with my ancestors. Say hey, you know, I'm trying to learn this traditional African language. You know, I'm trying to decolonize my mind, decolonize my mind. And then white Jesus came to me and was like, Gazi, I said, what white Jesus? I'm trying to decolonize my mind. He was like, no, right now you need to help white women. I was like, why? He was like, the white feminists are going crazy. Have you seen the Oscars? I said, no, white Jesus. And he sent me this video of Patricia Arquette who won the Oscar award. And she made this speech saying that women of color and people of color and and gay people and all kinds of people need to come around and rally because white women need their help. And I was like, what kind of help you need, Patty girl? What kind of help you need? And she says, we need help for the wage gap. We- okay, I'm sorry. I played the wrong video, but um, that one is uh, not about the assimilation versus um, 
appropriation that one's about the white women need help um yeah this is becky's he uh, they're they're always saying becky's all the time might be yo i'm still trying to figure out this whole technology thing he, he has a he has a video about um oh he wants to help white people with history and that's the one um that's about assimilation versus appropriation where he uh they basically state that um black people cannot appropriate white culture they can only assimilate white culture because white culture is um um oppressive by in in its nature mm. uh, so uh, by donning joker makeup it's sort of like a uh what, what would you call it a um subversion uh, of, a subversion yeah. of the assimilation that is being well, required I, mm -hmm. yeah much in the same way that i think uh in black culture the use of the n-word in order to connote friendship is like a taking back of a horrible thing that white people did and in this case uh, <laughs> a horrible thing that white people did was make the joker into a mainstream symbol of uh uh economic the economically oppressed uh avenging themselves um, right. And the Joker is the classic anti-hero. And I think uh, Ghazi is sort of setting themselves up to be a anti-hero style. Um, I think you wanted to compare them to uh, like the Rajneeshis. Yeah, this is very well. Uh, uh, Ghazi very much reminds me of uh, the spokesperson of the Rajneeshis from the 80s, Ma Anand Sheila, mm -hmm. who had a very similar, incredibly abrasive, aggressive, but also just witty and totally absorbing and charismatic style. You know, uh, they, they uh, in playing the, uh, and definitely understanding how they're perceived in media. Like this, uh, Ghazi, uh, I'm sure understands that they're playing the heel like in wrestling, they know that they're playing the heel because also one of the things that they keep promoting is the idea that Anne Frank was a colonizer, which mm -hmm. is <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah. The, uh, it's very funny because it's designed to piss off as many people as possible. Anne Frank, who is largely seen as this sacred, untouchable figure in uh, specifically anti-racism or anti-Semitism circles, mm -hmm. then questioning that. Uh, uh, that narrative, uh, especially in a way that would suggest that what befell her was her fault, essentially, well, <laughs> or that it's not what, worth caring about. What I find uh, interesting, such a great way to piss people off. I, I find it interesting that you have a lot of people saying, "Hey, this has to be a psyop because um, he's just trying to make sorry, they just trying to make um, communism look bad by being outlandish." And I kind of think that's a bit racist. It's like assuming that Ghazi doesn't have the capability to understand what they are doing. Um, mm. I well, think... especially since, did you see that those documents that came out that showed they actually have a very sophisticated capitalistic media strategy in order oh. to get noticed? I think I saw those. I think I liked it and said this only makes it better. Yes. Um, right. Uh, <laughs> you're right, it does, because they... <laughs> Because they're in full, they absolutely know how they're being perceived. Right. The you don't do this Joker shit. You with and it has the little creepy music in the background. You know people are gonna find this shit ridiculous and cringe and try hard, and that's why everyone is gonna share it. And now everyone knows what your Black Hammer organization is. So yeah. it doesn't matter if like people are sharing it mockingly. Eventually, you're gonna get eyeballs on it who are like sympathetic to that sort of black nationalist. Um, Actually, what what I would call it, black nationalist is probably not the right word for it, because what I would call it is an extremely, uh, an extreme version of Afro pessimism. Probably, are you familiar with Afro pessimism? I am not. Um, it's something they talk about. Um, it's it's sort of this new theory in a, a relatively new theory in black scholarship, which is uh, very much about. Uh, well, I'm going to read the Wikipedia page because it's pretty dense and difficult to understand. I don't even know if I understand it fully. So I'm just going to read the straight up definition from the Wikipedia page, which is according to the 2018 Oxford bibliography entry on Afro pessimism written by Patrice Douglas, uh, Salamwit de Terefe and uh, Frank B. Wilderson III. Afro-pessimism can be understood as a lens of interpretation that accounts for civil society's dependence on anti-black violence, a regime of violence that positions black people as 
in internal enemies of civil society. This violence, they argue, cannot be analogized with the regimes of violence that disciplines of the Marxist subaltern, the post-colonial subaltern, the colored but non-black Western immigrant, the non-black queer, or the non-black woman, according to Wilderson, the scholar who coined the term as it functions most popularly today. Afro-pessimism theorizes blackness as a position of, using the language of the scholar Saidia Hartman, accumulation and fungibility. Okay. That is, as a condition or of relation to ontological death, as opposed to the cultural identity or human subjectivity. Okay. So, if you I'm want, well, you understanding wanna, that yeah, correctly... You want to hear what I think about that? Okay. But we'll not save you next time. You know, you shouldn't knock Chinese potions. I have something in my pocket right now completely clear up that bruise on your forehead. What bruise? Oh. It's a Seagal moment that you have just played. I'm not sure what it has to do with Afro-pessimism, but this is Oh, I thought you said Chinese potions. Oh, it was Chinese potions. We were oh, talking about Chinese potions. I thought you were reading Chinese the definition potions. of Chinese potions. I was reading, uh, yes. Um, My that, bad. That, what, what's that clip from? What Seagal movie is that it's, from? It's a, the, the movie is called Steven Seagal's Best Fight Scenes Must Watch. And it's on, ah, YouTube. Right. It's on YouTube. You, it's six minutes long. It's a great film. That's a, <laughs> it's a great movie. <laughs> so from what I understand, I mean, we, we got Seagal on the brain because Seagal recently gave a samurai sword to Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela. Hi! in a very heartwarming display of international solidarity. Um, but Afro-pessimism, if I understand it, it says that um, capitalism is uniquely hostile to black people and black people alone, um, and is dependent on the... Um, D dependent on the oppression of black people in order to function uh, singularly, more so than any other type of oppressed person under capitalism, whether it be, uh, you know, the uh, people who are marginalized by class or by gender or by uh, other such things, uh, or even other races, you know. Uh, but to me, like, it seems like on its face... Um, the, the obvious criticism is that, well, what, what about indigenous people? Like, you, you can't, you, you clearly can't say that capitalism isn't also dependent on the expropriation of their land and labor. I feel like it's, it's as much dependent on that. Like, I feel that that's the easiest way to criticize it, is it positioning black people as being more oppressed than, say, indigenous people. It seems like an anti-solidarity thing. You know, it's... Uh, but I don't know. I don't understand this. I'm sure I got this wrong, and I'm sure what I just said was very offensive. I don't. So yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't want to position myself as an authority on this. But to me, this seems like the philosophy that the Black Hammer people subscribe to, that um, the the uh, capitalism is uniquely uh, positioned against Black people, yeah, which is why they need. And to, that's why they need white people to pay reparations, which is yes. His, I guess his. His biggest video is a video of um, called "White People Are Paying Reparations." It starts like this. Aquaba, y'all. So I was just chilling outside by the sun because I can do that because I'm black. And then White Jesus came to me and was like, "What, White Jesus?" And he was like, "You need to train." They're so stuff. funny. They're great. <laughs> Jesus. He was like, it's just like dogs. They need training. I said, "Okay, I'll do it." So now I'm going to show you. These well-trained male Saxons, toilet seat complexion individuals, okay? Disciples of white... Right, so he calls us uh, toilet seat complexion individuals, uh, which <laughs> it's I... Extremely funny. I like that. Ex it's, very funny. It, I, the, I can't... The similarities to, to Ruby Rod, or is it Ruby Rod or Ruby Road? Yeah, Ruby, Ruby Rod from... Um, from the fifth element yeah. uh chris tucker doing an offensive gay impression is <laughs> ends up being very similar to gazi's pace delivery but also just level of constant cleverness just the these very unique turns of phrase about white people like yeah, I, i'm fine with like i'm fine with like white hate if it's always this funny you know it's, it's great um i mean it it doesn't the thing about it it's like i don't think it, it's hateful and no. it's for the same reason I don't think Come Town is hateful. Basically, mm -hmm. it, I mean, he's you can kind of tell with people when they're coming from a good place or a bad place. And like, I don't think he's going to try to go machine gun down all the whites. Um, yeah. 
Just like I don't think Nick Mullen is responsible for all of these attacks on Asian people, even though maybe he is. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Nick Mullen is doing all the attacks on Asian people. It's, it's Nick Mullen him. is out there just yeah. beating up Asian it's people him. all day. It's been him yeah. the whole time. Uh, we yeah. have someone must stop him. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you know he and they they've been soliciting donations. Um, I, aren't they sort of saying that like you get like you can buy an indulgence sort of? Yes, yeah. There are things where like you can cleanse your white guilt by like they still won't let you in Hammer City because you're white, but mm-hmm. you can like uh, donate to them and get like special indulgences to cleanse your white guilt. Not unlike like the Catholic Church was giving out, right. which caused. And my theory is that there's going to be uh, a Martin Luther of the Black Hammer movement who's very upset about them giving these whiteness oh, indulgences out. Oh, no, like out. a super serious guy who's going to ruin yeah, it for ex- everyone? <laughs> extremely serious. Because, <laughs> yeah, there, there is this that sort of, you know, gay Catholic flair that Ghazi has. Uh, there is that. Because that's what I like about cultural Catholicism is it's so ornate and fancy there's this real decadence to catholicism Mm. that i sort of love because i i've said this before the reason why i think catholicism is funny um is because especially like according to augustine in order to get into the kingdom of heaven you gotta sin first because if you don't sin you can't confess and the only way to get closer to god is to confess right so catholicism obligates you to sin it obligates you to have a good time i mean it doesn't i mean it doesn't really but it, it, it riddle me riddle me this Stephen. Okay. why are all the party countries catholic italy spain mm-hmm. the fun part of ireland <laughs> which the fun part the, the, su- the southern ireland the southern uh, oh boy well i've never been to ireland i didn't know they liked to party um oh. <laughs> <laughs> we like to party Dun, 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 dun. Oh, man, I had a really bad joke that I'm just going to say here in the middle of the episode. I, it's the it's the Six Flags dancing old man, except he's getting off the Auschwitz train. And <laughs> Everybody get on! Six Flags Auschwitz! Okay. <laughs> I got that out of my system. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Auschwitz uh, jokes. We like them. Yeah. Em. I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish, fellas. Uh. It's all right. And my parents are in the CIA, so don't worry. I've got don't your back. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Ghazi, so before apparently Ghazi started this uh, Black Hammer operation, the serious organization that um, uh, they were just a YouTube personality. Well, and there's, they were, yes, but before that he was in the um, something called the Uhuru Movement. Uhuru and he was uh, appointed to be like a sort of a sub chairman in like the I think in some kind of like black socialist movement I think it might be called the Uhuru movement and he actually got yeah. kicked out of that um, I think because of his YouTube video content I think for some reason they thought that that wasn't good I haven't followed the history but that seems egregious like an egregious thing to have mm. been kicked out I wouldn't I don't think they should have kicked him out because he's He's so great. Okay. I've got, I, I, I'm not going to... I won't correct your pronouns every time, but well, I'm just saying, forgive us if we don't get the pronouns oh, right. Well, I'm listen, sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm a work in progress, and I'm a very damaged individual, so... Yes, um, uh, but, but I want to say that if we have any <laughs> non-binary fans listening, not that I think you would take ownership of Ghazi as somebody representing your community. I'm really uh, bad at the pronoun thing, so you have to... Uh, either yeah. either forgive me or just cut me out of your life because I'm going to mess it up. But yeah, it's it's not hateful. Like we said, we're just like Come Town, we're not hateful. Uh, well, we're just not, like Gossie, we're not, we're not hateful. I mean, Gossie might be a little hateful. I'm going to say Gossie. I don't know. <laughs> we, uh, it's, it is always interesting to tread so lightly around someone who um, does say objectionable things. Um like there's that yeah. whole thing about like when it's a when it's a non-binary person who's doing something horrible, do you have like, to? Pa- yeah, like Ben Hopkins from Power Bottom. Uh, sure. Uh, I don't think, I don't know. I don't no idea. Those were all just accusations. We should keep that in mind too. Um, yeah. Uh, like that guy. N- that but person I, I don't know. never. They seem was... pretty credible. Sure. I mean, I've seen Power Bottom like. Uh, referred to now as like an example of just like they kind of rolled over without a fight 
They were just like gave mm-hmm. up. And yeah. it's, I mean, well, you can't have that. I mean, especially because the audience that they cultivated was so it was extremely sensitive. Like you can't have that audience and also be accused of that stuff because they will turn on you if any whiff of that gets out. But yeah. yeah, Ben Hopkins was somebody who allegedly did terrible things and uh, was I mean, disowned. The things that he did, but were, still, you they have were to on use the they, Aziz, them pronouns. Like they were the Aziz level things. I'm pretty sure. No, no, it was no, it was mm. it was much worse than that. No, it was much much worse. I don't than think that. it was much much worse. I don't know. I don't remember the specifics, but no, I remember the spe- It was it was full on. Anyway, like, whenever really that happens, what, like the obvious thing to do is just a hard right pivot and join the... <laughs> yeah but they couldn't because they're <laughs> non-binary people so well, they had nowhere to go they had nowhere to pivot well soon, um, but soon yeah enough. you still you still got to use the right pronouns because it's about enforcing it into your head and normalizing it even if a, and it's also about acknowledging the humanity of non-binary people because non-binary people can be good or evil as well and so if you only use the they them pronouns for the good ones, you're only saying that you know only the good ones are are worthy of having right. there's some sort of purity test well, that you have to pass in order the, to earn is, your pronouns. That is exactly what the left does right back to people. They de-emphasize the humanity of people they disagree with all the time, and so mm-hmm. by pointing this out and receiving a negative response, you get that you know pretty standard quote unquote hypocritical or a hypocrite type of uh, point, which is not really a great mm-hmm. point. But yeah, I mean, anyone who holds a, a position right of center is delegitimized and, and is dehumanized by the left. I just want to point yeah. that out. So I, I don't agree with you fundamentally. Sorry. I think, well, yeah, that's fine. I, I think, but uh, I would say that, I would push back on that by saying that most leftists, most good leftists that I've met acknowledge and understand the humanity of people that are right of center. I think where they cut off is like the actual Nazis. I think they, they like, and I think it's, I think it is worth saying that Nazis absolutely do abdicate their humanity. I mean, maybe, but that's a lot of German people who, (laughs) it's a lot of German people. It's a lot of uh, Ukrainian people, Slovenian, Hungarian Bulgarian. It is a lot of people, but you know, once you commit to that ideology and you say we're gonna, our stated goal is to genocide everyone but us, you know, it's, it's hard to, yeah, it's hard to spin that into tolerance, you know. It's, yeah, I it's, mean, if you, but that's not too hard to spin it into the whole Mador, you know. I mean, it's not too hard to say that communists also. Uh, we're bent on the destruction of mass amounts of people. So, uh, yeah, I think that's true. But I, I also think that Stalinists abdicate their humanity as well to some degree. Uh, well, then uh, I don't know. I don't know. We we may not we may not find a welcome spot on either side. Yeah. Which well, is yeah, why I, you should join the Libertarian Party. <laughs> Join the Libertarian Party! <laughs> uh, no, uh, no, 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 yes, no. Do it, we, join it. We need some sort of third way. Yeah. Some sort of. No. <laughs> yes, yes, third way. No, oh, is that no, Gaddafi? No, yes. Gaddafi and Libertarians uh, unite. <laughs> you're right. Um, but that's what's funny about these. It talk about like. The, the this black hammer is a coalition of of queers and juggalos and uh hoteps and uh black nationalists and afro pessimists and i i think that's a very funny coalition and honestly i don't think they're that i don't think they're harmful i mean you could say they're harmful to the larger movement but nobody takes them seriously so i just think they're like i yeah. i just think they're like a, a fun dalliance yeah well i don't think it's a psyop um, cause I no, don't think it's not a psyop. Cause I don't think anyone takes communism seriously anyway. So <laughs> what are you trying, in, in, at least in this country, what are you trying to psyop? At? Like 90% of everyone here is okay with our economic system. I mean, sorry, uh, the Ber- the Bernie or bust movement busted and like that's, it's not taking off. I don't think it will ever take off, frankly. Um, now we're an anti left well, podcast. Think, well, no, no, I think I think material conditions for the average person need to get a lot worse for it to take off. But I think um, I I would also disagree in that 
I think uh, the BLM riots of last year were an example of that taking off or the example that people can rise up and, and do things other than electoralism or political organizing in order to get things done. And I think the fruit of that, however small, was the fact that Derek Chauvin got mm -hmm. uh, convicted on all three counts. You know, it shows that the riots showed people that there will be material consequences if you don't uh, show if if you don't do justice. Those and, riots were um, fully supported by all of the major corporations. Eh, what? Well, mm -hmm. no, they were. Yeah, they were. <laughs> no one, no major corporation said, "I'm glad they're throwing bricks through windows." I mean, they That's basically did. Coca Cola, they, they all basically did. They all had full support from the major corporations i and I, I do not think like it was who, a, like i think blm as an organization had major support but blm as an organization doesn't represent you know the okay. riots well, they don't represent why people simultaneous do these at the i mean perhaps this is a, a correlation and not a causation so maybe we, we can just say that's correlated but it's simultaneous you know to the these riots and um Ghazi calls them uprisings by the way they're uprisings mm -hmm. Um, they're uprisings. Yeah, these uprisings were taking place, and uh, all every single corporation was basically uh, putting out statements of support to the protesters. And uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. obviously, if pressed, they wouldn't say they support property damage, but uh, that's yeah, a lot. That's a line that was crossed that was noticed by conservatives. And then when the conservatives started trying to pass all these voting restriction bills, the same corporations came out against them there too. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to see this realignment with the corporations lining up uh, behind the Democrats, um, because it's sort of consolidating the anti-socialist bent of the Democrats. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it'd be interesting. To, I'm interested to see if Warren gets primaried in 2024 because she just announced she is running again. Um, who's gonna... Oh yeah, she's going to get pressed. She's one of the least popular. Uh... Is she a senator? Yes. I do you think Ke that little uh, redhead, uh, hot little redhead Kennedy's <laughs> <laughs> that little wet mouth Kennedy? Ooh, <laughs> ooh, he's got a wet little mouth. But um, also, I think the reason why corporations, I, 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 it's and it's the same thing with the CIA videos. The reason why corporations uh, go for this is because the people that they're going for, uh, the large amounts of the population are sympathetic uh, to Black Lives Matter. I think a larger, no, that's not true, not large amounts of population, but a larger share of the population is sympathetic to uh, the Black Lives Matter movement than not. And if you just crunch the numbers, which I'm sure they did, it's like, Chief, it's better for us to support mm -hmm. support the protesters than not. It's a cynical calculation. I don't think it removes anything from the movement. I think the movement is still uh, good. I think there still should be opposition to police. I think there should be serious questioning of police abolition and prison abolition. I think those cards are all on the table. And uh, just because a corporation understands that uh, having a shallow appreciation of this position will net the money doesn't necessarily undermine the message of that movement. Oh, sure. Um, my uh, my question kind of goes towards this anti-liberal and anti-democracy trait that I'm seeing on both the far left and the far right and how much that is informing... Um, um, these these ideas, uh, because as we saw in Minnesota, there actually was no popular will to abolish the police. The council, the city council in Minneapolis, retracted all of their statements and efforts towards defunding their police department. I mm -hmm. don't think there's any major popular will anywhere that wants to defund or abolish their police departments. No, not popular will. And I think, you know, part of that is to do with the problems with the word defund and abolish, which make people think we're going to live in uh, lawlessville. Right. I mean, but so the then the next thing that a leftist will do is say, well, screw that. We don't have to be like, it doesn't have to be a democratic thing. This is right. That's the right thing to do. It doesn't matter. 
the, the, a majority of people are wrong sometimes. Like in that poll on Twitter, could who would win in a fight, Goku or Superman? Obviously, mm -hmm. Superman would win. But oh hell no! Goku okay, no, won. Fuck, fuck by, off! No, Goku would win. No, he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. It's Goku because would absolutely it's because win it's not in Superman. his nature to be to do the trickery needed to beat Superman. It's a, it's very clear. It's not in his nature to. No, no. Mm -hmm. The nature of Goku is that he can be killed, but is always revived again and comes back even stronger than before. Goku the nature would of have Goku to is that blot he always out the comes sun back or or use a dirty trick like Kryptonite. And he wouldn't do either of those things. He would probably just give up. Okay, when... No, no, okay, no. Goku wouldn't do a dirty trick. You're absolutely right. But the thing is, Superman could kill Goku like... Uh, G Goku's like Doomsday. The only guy to have actually killed Superman. You can kill Goku, but they're just going to wish him back mm. with the Dragon Balls, or he's going to broker a deal with King Yama, well, then, and then he's going to come back and then are, do some intense training in the hyperbolic other, time train. These are other people and other things. If he has no Dragon Balls, if he has, if they're in a white void with just, I don't know, I guess the sun has to be... Does Superman require the sun? Can Superman... Yeah, Superman requires the yellow radiation of the sun in order uh, to get so his powers. So he wouldn't do well in the Matrix. Could no, he wouldn't do well in the... Maybe he wouldn't do well in a white Could Neo beat Superman? Uh, in the Matrix, yes. But not outside the Matrix. I don't know, actually, uh, uh, the extent of Neo's powers. But I, I will say that... No, I'm full-on Team Goku well, for that anyway, debate. Anyway, th just... This was to someone else who thought that the Superman was obviously the winner. He... His, res <laughs> his response to the poll was like, see, this is why democracies don't work, because sometimes majorities are just flat-out wrong. And I'm seeing leftists start to think that, and I'm seeing people on the far right start to think that. And that's scary to me. I don't like it. It is a little scary. I mean, I become a tanky a little when I think about the environment. You know, I, I, I have I've, I've said this on the last few episodes that first ref sometimes when I, I see the destruction and blight uh, of and the fact that, you know, if we just go up two degrees by 2035, we're going to have these fucking serious, massive problems. So there is that part of me which is like, maybe we should start getting the oil executives, you know? Maybe we should start getting them. Yeah, um, you know, like, like getting their kids. Because we can't goods. solve this. Yeah. <laughs> because, we, you know, it doesn't seem like we can solve this massive energy crisis through voting. It seems like the only thing that would solve it is actually forcibly putting an end to it. You know, but, they, you know, that's my climate doomerism. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not doomerism. It's just, you know, theorizing that the only way to get rid of the climate doom is to maybe embrace authoritarianism. You could try forgetting well, that, about it. That, unfortunately, is eco-fascism. Yeah, so I, mean, like, I my don't tactic, want to embrace that idea. <laughs> my tactic is just to forget about it. I'm just like, eh, I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think about something different. So, mm -hmm. because, yeah, it's bad. But you know what? Hey, it could always be worse, you know? That's what um, uh, Muslim yeah. Tom's wife said on You Can't Win. You got to play with the hands you got. Mm. You know, you're dealt with a hand. You got to have a positive attitude. Things could always be worse. It could be five degrees mm. warmer right now. And then we would uh, all be mm -hmm. just really sweating. Ah. But yeah, I see, I see uh, the development of an authoritarian left or the ideas of authoritarian ideas uh, taking root in the left that's become increasingly frustrated with the inability to get the needle moving with authoritarian uh, with uh, with yeah. liberalism it's on the right with, too uh, with the integralists the integralists and yeah. the marxists are like doing the shaking hands meme over both hating liberals small l it's like small l yeah. liberals not democrats yeah. i just mean people who believe in enlightenment values um like you can mean but honestly i mean i don't think there's a there's no horseshoe theory in this because tankies and fascists are still radically opposed at many relevant uh many relevant yeah terms, i don't call so. it horseshoe theory it's like tentacle theory it's like some there's there are these tentacles and then sometimes two tentacles reach out and latch on to each other but it's not a horseshoe um yeah. it's just like two awful tentacle monsters um, mm -hmm. sorry, I'm I'm in my crypto libertarian boy phase, everyone. Uh, <laughs> so, so just bear with me; it's gonna pass. Uh, another yeah. couple of weeks, and I'll go back to being a, a sock dem who wants to do some kind of weird tax scheme to make the rich people pay more, and then we can regulate. And then, 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 and
Meanwhile, I'm just going to descend into full tanky. I'm going to start yeah. buying exotic knives. Mao. I'm going to start getting a lot of patches. <laughs> well, the thing about Mao is, like, while I think you can easily discard Stalin, there is no Stalinist theory that's worth preserving. Uh, Mao is a little trickier because there is some Maoist theory that's absolutely worth preserving, uh, which is the idea of internationalism or third worldism. The idea that you can't really have any meaningful communist movement unless you involve every all the workers in the world and not just the ones in the Western countries. Otherwise, you're just doing um, otherwise you're just consolidating uh, the rights of the the world's bourgeoisie, really, uh, when really, if you want to do an actual communism, it has to involve uh, every African worker that supplies you with all of the mineral resources that you use in your phone. It, it has to be every Chinese worker that assembles those. Um, it has to be a real, actual internationalist revolution, which is something that Mao popularized. Um, and it finds its way back into the theory of guys that the left idolizes and, and are still considered pretty unproblematic figures like Thomas Sankara. So that's the issue with Mao is that... Uh, there were some some ideas, some ideas actually. I mean, but obviously Mao is an idiot who killed all the sparrows, and you'd uh, 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 there's yeah. lots uh, uh, pretty indefensible. You know, you shouldn't knock Chinese potions. Yeah, you shouldn't knock Chinese <laughs> yeah. potions. Well, that's that's funny because um, <laughs> the idea of traditional Chinese medicine was a Maoist propaganda scheme because they couldn't get what? Western med they didn't have access what? to Western medicines. What you're telling yeah, no. me, you're telling me that all these <laughs> all these tinctures is propaganda? <laughs> that's fucked up. You're telling man. me that you're telling me that my homeopathic medicine is not doing anything. Yeah, for well, me. that that uh, that is informing me a little bit on vaccine hesitancy. <laughs> I mean. Uh, it seems like Pfizer is pretty much hand in glove with the government, uh, the bad government, uh, the U.S. government. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's uh, what kind of what kind of thing? What kind of drugs are they hiding from us? They probably have like a make you real smart drug because they're obviously giving it to Joe Biden because yeah. he's doing a fantastic. They have the job. limitless drug. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Joe Biden just started. He takes the limitless drugs. I can see everything, Jack. Mm -hmm. I know. The goddamn stock market. I'm going to buy Dogecoin. <laughs> oh, man. I wonder who will be the first president to buy crypto. Oh, I'm sure Obama's got crypto. Obama's definitely got crypto. Well, okay. I mean, and he current. definitely invested in crypto while in office. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Th Michelle, have don't you heard of this so. cryptocurrency? <laughs> the world I, is descending into chaos. And we need some sort of public ledger in order to uh, keep our uh, confidence uh, in international market. currency going. I'm buying. I'm buying some of this Ethereum. Uh, let's check on uh, Dogecoin right now. What's going on with Doge? Did it keep dropping? Are we are we down yeah, let's even see if more? It keeps, uh, so I, I guess we swore we weren't going to mention Elon Musk on SNL, and I didn't watch it. Don't watch it. It's just psychic damage you don't need. But um, the funniest outcome of it was well, actually, I don't know. This is something funny. So. The idea was Elon Musk was essentially just going on SNL to promote Tesla and Dogecoin. And he wanted the price of Dogecoin to go up because if you mention it on national television, mm -hmm. then, you know, the idea is Dogecoin goes up in price. Everyone sends people into a buying frenzy. Yeah. Um, but the outcome of Elon's hosting on Saturday Night Live was Dogecoin tanked in price. Right. Um, I mean, it's recovering. But, it's recovering also. So. Yeah, of course it's. But that got me thinking is maybe the plan was to tank Dogecoin because then you can just buy a lot more shares and then have it recover at, when it's at a low right. point. Well, the, maybe I, the Elon was point. like, I know I am the least funny man in the world. No, no. And I will use this power to tank Dogecoin. I have the real plan. The real plan, C, was to make a line graph look like the outline of a Doge. And they did. <laughs> so um, what you're seeing is is concentrated stock man manipulation to draw a picture with a line graph. And it's beautiful. I, I thought we were doing yeah. that with the uh, coronavirus at one point because um, I mapped mm -hmm. out the coronavirus statistics to the outline of the profile of George Washington. Um, got zero <laughs> likes on Twitter. <laughs> you should have chosen a weirder celebrity. You should have chosen a more. You should have chosen Waluigi. Oh right, uh, who uh, who apparently Elon 
Musk played. He played Wario. Yeah, What's Wario. The he difference? played. Who's, I don't know. I don't care. Is Waluigi's Wario's brother? Uh, Waluigi. It's unknown, actually. Uh, there's a lot oh. of there's a lot of questioning about <laughs> what their relationship is. Uh, uh, perhaps they're lovers. Perhaps that you know it's that that classic bear and twink relationship that you see a lot of the time. The only problem is sixty nining is very difficult because of height differential. Okay. So we don't do that a lot. Um, so final my thoughts on uh, the Black Hammer and Gazi is that they're fine. Don't don't worry about them. They're just funny. You don't have to worry about them. Uh, just look at them and be like, ah, what interesting folk. Yeah, I mean, you know, you should follow them and watch their videos because it's very funny. Don't give them money. Well, <laughs> don't no, give them give any them money. money. You can give them some money. I don't think, are they doing anything bad with it? Probably. Who cares? I don't know. Probably. I wonder if, like, they'll do, like, the whole uh, BLM organizer thing where they just take the money and then buy, uh, then embezzle it. Yeah, I mean, it sort of leads into reparations, which I think we've both said before we're in favor of. Um yeah, we're definitely in favor of reparations. I guess the question is, what form do reparations take? Yeah, you know, that's, is and, it that, and the payments? answer is that's not, yeah. we don't get to really, that's not, we don't get to like lay down the first offer. So, you know, we, no, we got to see, see what they yeah. have in mind. And mm-hmm. hopefully it's something funny like everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then absolutely. we can be like, darn it. Okay. And then okay, can we negotiate you from up there? How, how about, about instead of everything? How about everything for four hundred years or so? You say, and then after yeah. that, we can have then we can get some stuff back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. you know, we should also do reparations for the Native Americans and everyone in America. All three hundred and thirty million of us should move back to mm-hmm. England. Yes, at once. Uh, no. Yes. No. Oh, no. oh my. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go there. Please, yes. no. Dude, can you uh, imagine if if all of the Americans tried to pile into that tiny little island? Tried to move back. There's just like a, a Zionist movement erupts for every single, like all the Irish Americans are going back to Ireland mm. and Ireland's filled with pricks from Southie going like, hey, you Irish people aren't real Irish people. You ever heard of the Dropkick Murphys? <laughs> you guys are like the fucking dick sucking Murphys, I say. <laughs> you guys are like, well, you're like James Joyce. You're like speaking like big fags. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, yeah, the, 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 and the, ori- the original Irish people are the Palestinians, and all the Southie guys keep evicting them from their yeah. houses. Oh yeah, uh, let's make it happen. There's, it'll, there'll be like a great Christopher Nolan movie moment where, like, the uh, English people see a flotilla, a huge American flotilla led by Donald Trump, and we're coming back <laughs> to live in England because we gave we all of America Scotland. back to the indigenous people. Yeah. Which we should do. I mean, yeah, we should. I mean, probably, if you want to uncurse the... I, the thing that I say that I believe is that we are on cursed land. We It is like the whole thing about you see in media, especially like it appears in Stephen King novels, is we built this on an Indian burial ground. That's true. Everything's built on an Indian burial ground. That's like the, the, the Shining is a metaphor for America mm. in a lot of ways. Um because that's that's what we live. We live in a hotel. We live in a this bourgeois world built on an Indian burial ground, and we're cursed by the spirits of that right. uh, decadence from uh, so, uh, th- fueled by suffering. Let me do a small metaphor, if you will. Ja- so it's yeah. Jack Torrance, correct? Yeah. Jack Torrance is the Boomers, and Danny <laughs> Torrance is the Millennials. And mm-hmm. the Gen X is the wife, who I don't remember the name of. Shelley Duvall. Shelley Duvall. Who, who, what's Shelley Duvall's yeah. name? In... I I don't know her name. I don't I don't remember her name. Yeah. In the Gen movie. X is Shelley Duvall. What do you? How, mm. how do you, How do you think of my metaphor? I I think it's because he's because <laughs> it's, it's the boomer who's antagonizing Gen X and and the millennials. Although uh, Danny Torrance. If Danny Torrance was born in the in the movie time, uh, he would probably be, he's a he's a Gen Xer. So, uh, but you. that's kind of thing because in Doctor Sleep, I think the boomers terrorizing the Gen Xers into complacency is basically the the uh, in Doctor Sleep, and in Doctor Sleep, uh, uh, it's 
Danny, the Gen Xer, the out of it Gen Xer who can't use his powers, his God given psychic powers in order to do anything. But he meets a little psychic Zoomer girl, and through her help, they're able to cleanse the the spirits of the of the Overlook Hotel. Uh, Doctor Sleep is is actually really cool. It's it's underrated. Uh, there's a lot in it. I mean, it's really ridiculous, but um, it's not as bad of a movie as everyone said it was. Never seen it. When did it, when did that come out? A couple of years ago. I want to say like three oh, wow. three years ago. I've stopped watching anything. Mm-hmm. Just one hundred percent. Do not watch TV or movies anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why. I I find them boring. I guess. Uh, I find them lacking in artness. I've uh, I have a thing I call artness, and it's artness, like how yeah. much of a, how much good of an art it is. I ca- I kind of came up with this idea myself um, of ranking the arts uh, yes. on a number scale of one to ten. Yes, and uh, I've just been finding movies and TV at like a zero to one lately. You you just uh, you're not paying attention. Well, I think especially with modern television especially streaming television there is this blandness and sameness that sort of uh uh, infects it all especially with the way that a lot of modern television is shot as well which seems to have that uniform ps3 uh xbox 360 era brown with light bloom for some reason that is the aesthetic that series take on and even like in the new marvel movies like you saw the screenshots from the eternals like chloe zhao oscar winner chloe zhao is gonna put a sunset in her movie and they just look like total shit Mm. they look like washed out boring shit um and but that's the aesthetic for everything now like, I'm trying to think of a show... Like, there's nothing going to be as dynamically shot as The Shield, which is, like, has... Even Breaking Bad, with its racist yellow Mexican filters, had a more dynamic aesthetic. What do you mean? They uh, would put a filter on every time there was a Mexican person? Yeah, every time in a... So, it's um, a common trope, especially in uh, uh, Golden Age of TV dramas, when, when they're depicting Mexico. Even in Sicario... Uh, the Denis Villeneuve movie, they put a a yellow filter over it in order Mm. to connote it's really hot here and it's sort of like gross. (laughs) And it's a racist trope of putting yellow filter over Mexico. Funny enough, one of the shows that depicts Mexico very nicely is Eastbound and Down, Mm -hmm. which is not a show known for its sensitivity, but because it has this inherent humanity in it, like it recognizes Mexican people are people and it actually portrays Mexico pretty accurately like looking sort of lush and normal and like uh uh it doesn't have a yellow filter over it yeah, also so- in a there's a very great hbo series called los spookies uh which i highly recommend uh which is about mexico as well if you're looking and that's t- talk about a show that's actually shot really well and that has like a lot of color and doesn't look washed out uh so yeah I, I recommend that show but i i, I think yeah a huge reason why a lot of TV is, especially modern TV, is not hitting that same thing is because it really looks the same. It's visually indistinct. And in a visual medium, that's kind of important. It's also all the same stories. I mean, it's everything mm-hmm. is being recycled. So I think that's what <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, but that's all, we, all the time. Not all the time. The Shining is, I mean, the book, The Shining, is not a recycle of anything. and there... Well, it's just a ghost story, really. I guess. I mean, I don't know. Just a different type of ghost story. You know, everything's always being recycled. But I think it's media saturation. It's just there's so much content that it all seems the same, right? Yeah, the big media, they don't pick the good the good things anymore. Uh, mm. I don't know. I don't know how. I think we're in the, the crest of a wave with the streaming services. Like, we're, we're there's an overabundance of streams. It's like we're being pissed on by all these different streams now. And, <laughs> don't cross the streams. And yeah. it's and it's like you now we're back to if you want to have like all the content, you're back to having to pay like two, three hundred bucks a month to get every streaming service. Mm-hmm. They're gonna start restricting it at like more, so you know the episodes are gonna be only on Apple or whatever. There's still like a Tom Hanks movie that you can't see unless you have Apple. Um, I also it's also the fact that it's just so fucking market tested now like Netflix has an algorithm to determine what shows will and won't work yeah. and they have an algorithm for even story beats and script writing to find so so there's this great old Frank Zappa quote 
where he's talking about how the music industry changed from when he was young to uh, when he was giving the interview in the 80s. And what he says is that the music industry used to be producers in the music industry were all these old cigar chomping guys who were like, look, I don't know what the kids want. So we're just going to try a whole bunch of things and whatever sticks we go with. Right. And that was the old attitude where you would just like, we have no idea uh, how to anticipate what people will want. Because, you know, a lot of the times when something is a cultural phenomenon, it's like a total black swan event, right? It, people didn't expect it before, like it, it, because it's just so new and fresh and original that there was and there's no precedent for it, like something like The Simpsons, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what's also notable about The Simpsons is that James L. Brooks, using his producer clout, was able to get it so that Fox producers weren't able to interfere with the writing of it, too. Um but that has changed. In, in the Frank Zappa quote, he says, all those cigar chomping guys got replaced by guys with MBAs. Do you think, think The that, Simpsons look, now, do you think The Simpsons has changed now and that, and that the executives are allowed into the writing room? Because if not, maybe they should be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they write The Simpsons like, anymore. Well, so I, we, we can bring up the uh, interview with uh, Schwarzfelder, um, which came out in the new yorker did you read the interview oh yeah it's it's the rosetta anyone anyone who is anyone was reading it like it's the fucking dead sea scrolls yeah and... there wasn't too much content in there i was hoping he was going to be asked about like some conservative politics or something and he wasn't yeah but they're not gonna they're not gonna get into that in, into the new yorker i think john schwartzwelder it, okay so it's funny there's only two conservative comedians Actually, that's not true. DePaulo was funny before he became overtly political in his material. There's a lot of actually funny conservative comedians, but um, yeah, no, the it, and it's the same yeah. with left wing comedians too. It's like their material is usually always weakest at at its most overtly political. Mm -hmm. But the two most prominent conservative comedy people are John Schwartzwelder and Norm Macdonald, and they also happen to be the funniest comedy people of all time. Which is, and I think the reason why they're so funny, too, is because they normally, I mean, tangentially, their conservative of politics might appear in their writing, but really, it doesn't at all. And uh, the thing that unites them, more than anything else, more important than them being conservative is them being anti-authoritarian, you know, skeptical mm. of the government, right? Yeah. And that sort of informs their comedy, which is, you know, skeptical of anyone that presents themselves as some sort of authority or who wants to tell you what to do. And that's, I think, the heart of the comedy, right? Yeah. Um, I, I also think there's more conservative uh, comedians out there who just don't broadcast it at all. Like any comedian who is, quote unquote, clean, uh, doesn't <laughs> like basically that's a code word for probably conservative. They're generally like the family or like, you know, Tom Papa. Yeah, Gaffigan. Gaffigan probably has some opinions you wouldn't agree with. G Gaffigan is um is a lib, I, I would say. Yeah. And to... But he's Catholic, right? So he's got to be anti... Is he is he pro-choice or anti-choice? I don't know. I haven't I haven't examined the politics. I, did, I have noticed that Gaffigan now talks about politics a lot. And I think to be a successful conservative comedian you have to not bring up current politics because it just turn that will turn people off but if you well unless you're going for that crowd Ugh, but who wants to go for that crowd like tim dylan lots of people like anyone that has a comedy special called triggered tim dylan know? is doing that right now and it's annoying yeah it sucks tim dylan uh tim dylan's kind of funny sometimes but just yeah they're doing too much pol i mean it's the same with left wing like harry condobolu not funny because it's just all of this sort of, it's like what it's like a, what Chapo said about why conservatives aren't funny. Because they get too mad about what they're talking about halfway through the joke to finish the joke. Yeah. And you can apply that to the same sort of left-wing firebrand comedians. Even like David Cross, like when he was doing his anti-Bush material. Whenever he got its most fiery, it was, it, it was at its most cringe. Although some of David Cross's political material still is extremely fucking funny, especially his bit about Strom Thurmond where he says, my dick is colorblind and it is the bane of my existence. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, there's uh, various theories of comedy. Um, the other thing that happened this week that was insane, uh, especially if you follow any... Uh, any of the global 
elite news is the Bill Gates Epstein confirmation that yeah. Melinda Gates did indeed divorce Bill Gates because yeah. of his association with uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And uh, this came out in the Daily Beast and has just been reaffirmed in the Wall Street Journal yeah. Wall saying Street that Journal. in div <laughs> yeah, divorce proceedings in 2019 uh, indicated that Mel uh, that uh, Melinda Gates's main concern was <laughs> her well, husband's link to sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. You see, Melinda Gates is a global advocate for women and girls. Um, so yeah. it would be very concerning, no doubt, if her husband was revealed to hang out with someone who is the opposite of a global advocate for women and girls. Yes. Well, he does advocate for them to do one thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> so... Yeah, that's and and if you so everyone was posting McConaughey smoking meme, everyone was like, "Oh my god, this is just evidence of like PizzaGate is real. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely real. All of this shit is real." Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it it's just a fantastic thing to behold that the most powerful people in the world either participate in sex trafficking or are glad to ignore it in favor of consolidating power right uh, which uh, is you know they're they're the they're the exact monsters and dead-eyed creeps you think they are yeah i mean and i would be agnostic. nothing's gonna happen i would i'm firmly agnostic on the epstein thing like i i would be surprised if epstein and his cronies were so powerful that they could keep the fbi from finding out that other extremely rich and powerful people um are pedophiles because the fbi gets a hard on for rich and famous pedophiles um mm -hmm. so it would be pretty hard to stop them from wanting to dig around in say bill gates um i don't think i mean I, I i don't think that's true i think the thing with epstein is it's not just him it's it's uh you know it's clinton and it's okay I, but clinton does everyone clinton doesn't have power anymore oh i know it, it, it yeah very he much doesn't do. that because like it's a fundamental misunderstanding of our society this like conspiratorial thinking it's not valid thinking it's disorder no, i think they have power in as much as they have uh, bill gates has power through the bill and melinda gates foundation i guess it's just going to be the bill gates foundation now. and uh <laughs> um uh and clinton's through the clinton foundation their power comes through these and NGOs. soros through the soros foundation all these yeah foundations. I, no. I agree no i, agree. I don't agree power. there's no it's mm. like you're putting way too i mean much i don't think they have into it no, they don't have the power to control everything. It's not like they're the, the supreme world controllers, but do they have more power than the average bear? Can they direct labor and resources at their whims? Absolutely. They can direct think uh, Look tanks. at what the Clinton Foundation did in Haiti. They can set up websites. They can send emails. I don't think that they can deter the FBI from investigating pedophilia. Uh, I don't know. That's the thing with all this shit. Is it? Is it makes you doubt it? Is it? Um, it gives you pause to actually. It gives you real, actual reasons to think that uh, all of authority is corrupt. Mm. Yeah, mm. and I'm I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not saying that you know there are probably elements of the FBI that are definitely into investigating powerful pedophiles, but um, just given what we know. I'm, I don't find the conclusion that it's all set up uh, unreasonable. You know, there's I feel like uh, uh, that's, you know, why everyone's posting the McConaughey smoking meme. Uh, it it the, the, all of this information fuels that incredibly conspiratorial part okay, of you. But you just thinks, you, your main point of evidence was just that since everyone is posting the McConaughey smoking memes, it must be true. <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> not what I'm saying. It's not that I'm true. I'm just saying that this this thing uh, activates the conspiratorial part of you it just it just uh this type of information cannot help but make you think that everyone's in on it because it just uh it's just not clear evidence 
but just such coincidental evidence. This this sort of Jimmy Garrison like coming together of various facts yeah. that seem too too good to be just coincidental. You know, I mean, the the Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos was able to convince she, she was a similar con person as Epstein was, I think, mm-hmm. and she was able to convince a lot of powerful people that she was on to something with all with because of her mental acuity her acumen and i'm not seeing similar cons- like that does that activate your conspiracy sensors because yes absolutely <laughs> it activates my conspiracy it, why sensors. isn't it not just as simple as a con artist conning people uh, I guess it's not as simple as a con artist conning people because of, you know, the whole, all of the lurid, de- the details are far more lurid than Elizabeth Holmes, what with the private island and the sex trafficking and the, and, you know, it, and it's that sort of eyes wide shut quality to it. The fa- And I think, you know, uh, eyes wide shut might have a lot to do. Uh, and the fact uh, and the fact that Alex Jones has been saying, you know, forever that they're fucking children next to owls, you know, this has all been part of of these conspiracy narratives and the details of the Epstein case hew very closely (laughs) to these conspiracy narratives, Um, which is, you know, why it's going to set off your, your thinking about that sort of stuff. Well, I remain Um, skeptical, but yeah, I think your yeah, I think your explanation that the universe is entirely chaotic is usually the right explanation. The universe is chaotic and you're usually reading too much into coincidences is usually the, correct to answer but uh, yeah. then shit like melinda gates like was very concerned about bill gates with epstein comes off and then suddenly you're thinking that you know they were they were doing bad stuff to to little girls together and uh, it sends you into the spiral and well, uh, yeah that i mean that could also have happened it's just what like after that you get into some really weird stuff i mean if epstein was trying to get other rich dudes to go rape with him that um seems like behavior that is you don't have to attribute to a conspiracy it's it's the stuff that comes after that when it's when we start talking about like global cabals that i it starts to lose uh my interest um I, yeah, I'm a highly aware of Bilderberg Group, Bohemian Grove, all the B's, all the yeah, <laughs> all the B words. Oh, there's one D. The there's Davos. Um, Davos. And um, you know, Bilderberg Workshop, like Build a Bear Workshop, right. but Bilderberg Workshop. <laughs> <laughs> we're, kids, we're gonna take you to Bilderberg Workshop. Get your owls. Get your owl dolls. I just think it works differently than how people are. Uh, talking about it and that it's not useful to talk about it so conspiratorially but yes i don't i think that's true i well i think the idea behind these people is that they control 100 percent of the world which is obviously not true they uh i feel like at at max they can probably control five percent of the economy maybe and that's like being generous and the rest of it is so chaotic that you can never fully account for anything. I don't think there is any one force powerful enough on Earth to say that, you know, we are the main drivers of uh, political economy. Although, I mean, even non-conspiratorially, you can see what an effect that these individuals have on people. Because of uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Bill Gates uh, be almost single-handedly blocking the uh, IP being released for the vaccines. That... Um, and- it's also unclear to me how single-handedly he did block that, other than by Maybe just not giving single-handedly. An, he just gave an interview where he said he didn't think that was a good idea. No, no, there was there was actual lobbying on his part, especially early on, uh, where the Oxford vaccine, which later became the AstraZeneca vaccine, Oxford wanted to give it away for free, and Bill Gates specifically intervened and said, "No, it has to be sold through a company for X reasons." Yeah, well, he um, he loves uh, intellectual property. That's he's a been, big fan. Well, not really. Yeah, well, he <laughs> he's, loves he's Mr. Antitrust. He loves, yeah, he loves taking it. Um, um, yeah. No, but yeah, Microsoft patented the double click at one point. They love to take mm-hmm. patents and patent stuff and make it so you can't. Every time you double click, you owe Microsoft money. Um, yeah. 
Pay a tax to the Microsoft man for your clicking. Yeah, I mean, they're getting it. If we want to get into that, that may that should be a different episode. Um, I would uh, like the IP console. Yeah, yeah, we could do a whole episode on IP consolidation. Have... That's sort of what Kingdom Heartsification is about, well, uh, too, as well. Yeah, I think that's also why we see so much recycled material. Is it's easier mm-hmm. um, to not to deal with. Uh, you you know you already own the rights, so why not milk it as much as you can? Yeah. Wait until some other stuff. Um, comes up for grabs every year there's gonna now every year starting now there's gonna be a new um set of movies and tv scripts that lose their copyright so hopefully right. we'll get some better stuff uh also i think what you say about conspiracy is interesting too when applied to black hammer as well <laughs> which people are saying is an op yeah because no it's much more easily explained by this one very charismatic person was able to get a lot of people to uh, go along with the popular idea of violently disassociating yourself from the white supremacist society that you live in. I, I get why people are attracted to that. Why wouldn't you be? The idea Everyone wants to make their own little city out, and every, every kid had the fantasy of, I'm declaring that this is my own country, mm-hmm. you know? Every every free man of the land, every free, every, and in this case, free they of the land. Uh, free them of the land, and we we're, we're gonna. So yeah, I I think the the X is an op thing is always unhelpful. Uh, yeah, calling <laughs> stuff not... a psyop is in fact a psyop. Yes, yeah. they want you to think stuff, and is it's a done by the 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 gatekeepers who are um, uh, deciding what content is acceptable and what is not, and it's generally white dudes on Twitter. Mm-hmm. All, everyone, I guarantee you, everyone saying something X is a psyop is some um, keyboard warrior, beardo, mm-hmm. like you and me. Mm-hmm. Like yes, <laughs> we're all part of a. Uh, we're all part of it. I've, uh, I've sheathed my keyboard. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I I had this horrible vision that that Chinese rocket that was launched was just gonna land smack dab in the middle of Hammer City. <laughs> yeah, was, next time. You know, you all the Chinese rocket potions. debris. Oh no! I have something in my pocket right now. Yeah, you should knock Chinese potions. Um, yeah, uh, we're, yeah, we're doing our sinophobia, our Steven Seagal sinophobia. Um, he he's a member of the Triads. Excuse you. Uh, he is a member of the Triads. He was a member of the CIA. He's a member of the Triads, the CIA, um, the Yakuza. Uh, I yeah. believe he's in MS13. He also mm-hmm. is uh, the Russian. What's the Russian one called? I don't even know. Uh, he's, he does special special nuts. No, that's I the think they, special. They call soldiers. it vodka sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is Russian mafia vodka sauce. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that, hey, isn't that Italian? Shut up! No. <laughs> 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 yeah, instead of instead of saying awesome sauce, our nerds say vodka sauce. Uh, uh, I like the idea. That's a yeah, that was an old sketch on the Dana Carvey show. Is um, ru- uh, Germans who say nice things, and it's you know, you look very nice today, <laughs> and that is the joke. Um, but I always thought the I, I like everyone likes friendly Slavs. Uh, it is me, Sergey, the friendliest Slav. Yeah. How are you today? Can I help you with your tires? Do you need spelling? Would you like a cake? You know, uh, I like the idea of groups of smiley, friendly Slavs. Because you know they've got Slavs have gotten a bad rap as sort of a depressive people when really yeah. no. Well, the joke used to be that they were culturally behind and that they were like just discovering Michael Jackson in like like two thousand. That was always the big joke mm-hmm. about Eastern Europe. It was like they just they, they just now are entering the eighties because you know stuff has to make its way across the Iron Curtain through Samizdat through like they got to mm-hmm. like write everything down like on little scrolls like the way they got Michael Jackson was it was transcribed onto little scrolls that were stuck up someone's ass and then they, yeah. they walked <laughs> they walked into the Ukraine and then they like took took it out and then they re recorded it and then it's like that's Michael Jackson we finally got Michael Jackson because yeah. this is thriller <laughs> yeah in night. <laughs> Fighting for life. <laughs> they do the zombie dance, but they do the little Russian dance while doing the zombie well, dance. Well, now that we have... So it, it, that kind of uh, is close to an interesting topic, which is that like now we're going to start seeing internet zones. Each country is going to have an internet zone. Like China has its zone, and China's the new model. And 
countries are going to start being culturally out of sync and we won't know it unless we're unless we're like specifically trying to cross barriers which the governments are going to stop wanting us to talk to people in other countries soon i almost guarantee it mm -hmm. like tr you should try to talk to russian people um if you can while you st while you yeah, still can might go away soon yeah i think you're i think you're right the impending deglobalization of the internet mm -hmm. is going to be one of uh, the very uh, a huge problem especially in what we stated earlier where it's like the, the goal of communism ultimately is internationalist, right? So the fact that China has already cut us off means that, and, and because Chinese workers are absolutely, you know, one of the most integral people to get into it, like a, a international communist movement, it's uh, we're already at a disadvantageous position. This is where this is where we have the shake hands meme of the Marxists with the libertarians, because I think it would be more beneficial to um, your causes, your people's causes, to yes, my people. Your people. Yeah. <laughs> to, to stop demonizing libertarians as the pedophiles when it's obviously the libs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can see. It's Bill Gates, it's Jeffrey Epstein, all yeah. libs. You know? Come on now. Ed Buck. Because, um, you know, and, and the, the question is which tactic is more effective. You know, I try to think Machiavellianly as much as I can. And so which <laughs> tactic is more effective? shaking hands with the integralists and being like yeah it's going to be top down it's authority we must have morals in this house or is it going to be like through the libertarians desire to basically destroy the state which is the old school uh marxist vision well i think yeah there was a or an anarchist vision i think there is overlap with anarcho libertarian ideas mm -hmm. but um i think what it comes down to is we're separated more by aesthetic than anything else we're separated more by the fact that libertarianism and and sort of the cultural trappings of libertarian libertarianism i.e reddit and rick and morty are mm -hmm. totally fucking lame yeah and well, people don't want to be associated with it Reddit's i mean i like rick and too. morty but, yeah reddit's pretty yeah, lib reddit is these very days lib. um i hate i hate reddit so much i've gotten to the point where i do not I, i'll say something on reddit and get replies and just not look at the, the replies are garbage i just throw the replies yeah. away just a, a low quality of poster on reddit yeah uh, and lower quality since they removed all the psychos, which they had to do. I get it. But uh, the fun thing about Reddit was the psychos. Yeah, it's like sucks. are the Donald that they like. I don't know why. I guess I guess words are just too too kinetic. You know, words are just too violent. So. No, it's not too violent. It's the same thing with uh, why the companies supported the BLM protests. You could, as long as you superficially do something, it's going to be uh, you need to crunch the numbers and find out what superficial affectation will hurt your bottom line the least. And yeah. the superficial affectation that Reddit chose was uh, down the center lib. Yeah, I mean, they are like one of the most, they are, I think the number four most popular internet site in the world. Um, they're owned by Condé yeah. Nast. Uh, so they're corporate. But yeah, it, it's the same thing when like a government gets big, you know, a government um, ha doesn't have an interest in offending people. Like, a government shouldn't offend its own citizens, right? And these gigantic tech companies essentially act as their own little parallel governments. And once they get large enough, they have a vested interest in not offending their own citizens, yeah. right? You know, which is That's why, you know, uh, uh, yeah, Twitter, Twitter banned Donald Trump because they crunched the numbers and they found out more people would prefer him banned than not, and so they did it. That's the only calculus. And Donald Trump the right, only, announced, was it this Wednesday? I lost track of time. It was, I think, this Wednesday they announced he's still banned on Facebook. Ah, uh, dang. Dang. Well, that's bad for him because I'm sure, like, it wasn't just Twitter. Like, a lot of the a lot of his older base is probably on Facebook, and it is yeah. really hard for him. Especially if, can he, he wasn't, he was not convicted, right? When he got impeached, he wasn't actually convicted, Correct. right? Correct. They, it, so he could run for president and, again. and will yes <laughs> yeah. yeah oh man that'll be crazy that's gonna be nice i'm looking forward to uh -huh. it uh you know i hopefully justin amash will run as the libertarian party and i'll finally be able to vote for a libertarian because there hasn't been any good ones in my lifetime except for ron paul no. but i couldn't, I couldn't vote. <laughs> no I couldn't, yeah wrong yeah i like it I, okay what i mean good libertarian i mean like fairly serious and has a political backing of a movement like yeah whoever they ran last time was a no-name 
and the time before that. Ron Paul didn't run as a Libertarian Party guy, though. He ran as a Republican. Right. And, like, the Libertarian Party generally doesn't get a, a, a viable politician, but they might get one with Justin Amash, who I like. Yeah. And who had recently had a discussion with AOC. Yeah. And uh, was like, this was really productive. So, uh, yeah, you know, he's not so bad. Yeah. Uh, all you big government types... Um, I should. I'm gonna have to put a trigger warning for all you big government types who want the health care and the improving of the material conditions of the classes. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know. As long as the first, cl as the first best class comes first, we're cool with that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, ugh, yeah. ugh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, libertarians. I mean, th that's the thing is, I think there is a lot of a lot more overlap between libertarians and libertarian socialists than we'd want to admit, because we just hate them aesthetically. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. I think we we need these people in our corner. Uh, we need everyone in our corner. As much as it sucks, we need the Voshis in our corner too. Is he more big government into that kind of stuff? No, uh, Vosh. The, I, he, his, he's a market socialist. His thing is market socialism. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that he, he says. And he says, uh, but it's on the path to anarcho-syndicalism. Oh, great. Uh, Mr. Chomsky. I mean, the Vosh crowd is weird, but what I've learned from interacting with them is they're all, like, 20 years old. So it's like I don't, I don't necessarily blame them for having, like, undeveloped or incoherent politics sometimes. Yeah, I mean, anarcho-syndicalism is kind of Jeffersonian. It's like the... We're, we're all gonna, yeoman farmers yeah, we're, yeah. we're all gonna be make like who's gonna be in the nuts and bolts factory when you're anarcho-syndicalist uh, society is my question who's gonna be doing uh, who's gonna be cold there are theories for that i haven't read the theory but i think there there are there are definitely ways to address that uh in in that formulation um i think i mean in in kropotkin's theory uh kropotkin theorizes you know who does the dirty labor and uh how we should uh how we should uh, get people to do the unwholesome labor. And it's sort of, it depends more on, you know, uh, stake and culture, uh, culture and stake in the community than I'd like. Less on sort of material uh, ends, but more on sort of a cultural understanding. But I, I, no, there are definitely models in anarchy to explain how to get people to do hard jobs. So, uh, and I, because I, I don't think either of us read theory. <laughs> we don't. Well, that's we because I accept, the, I, I accept the supremacy of the Pfizer method of getting people to do jobs they don't want to do, which is you get them addicted to a painkiller and then they'll do anything. There you go. Yeah. That works the best. That's how, that's how I got domed See, for the first time. That's the, that's the efficiency of the market. <laughs> <laughs> Give everyone heroin, make them super desperate. Uh, then you'll get dome. You'll get cheap dome all over the place. What do you mean? That's how you got? I don't know if I want to know the answer to this question. <laughs> dome is head. I know it's, what dome uh, is, but what do you? I don't. I again. No, the joke I, is I I got somebody addicted to heroin and and then got them to suck my dick to give them more heroin. Oh, that's what you did, huh? Yeah, okay. that's that's what definitely what that's I did. That's definitely I what you did. And who? And that person's name is. Uh, that person's Sorry, name no. is Ed Buck. I cre that's <laughs> right. I created Ed Buck. <laughs> oh man, you I got was the started. one. Uh, so just to round out the episode, it's Mother's Day today when we're recording this, Ooh. and what I think is very interesting the the mother <laughs> on the internet that I want to talk about is Liz Brunig. Boo, boo, Liz Brunig. No, <laughs> we we both love Liz Brunig because I mean I uh, don't she love appeals her. I, I, okay, I, I would go so far as to say I love Liz I mean, Brunig because I, I think the, she's very funny and wholesome. I find the, like, Instagram pictures of the food she makes on Twitter to be a bit annoying. I, see, I like that part of her. I think it's cute. I, I mean, of course it's heavily cultivated to make her seem like domestic, uh, domestic goddess, but I think she's, uh, really good at tailoring her social media presence to come off as genuine. And I think whenever I hear her on a podcast talking about stuff, she comes across as like, no, she is this person. She is this sort of like, she likes to bake and she likes to nurture and she loves her children and she loves her husband. And, uh, you know. Yeah, but it's much I it's think... much harder to be like a, a cool libertarian crypto bro. It's much harder to be like that. <laughs> it's easy to do what she does. What I do, that takes skill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think the hate for her is it's like pretty obvious because she has a very enviable life. 
and she uh, says things that other people say, but on a level that's supported by uh, uh, corporate media that I think people point out to her constantly as if it's some big own. Yeah. And like she doesn't already know she works for, for Jeff Bezos. Well, she's also, she's always attacked by the right people. Like the people that you want to be attacked by because it makes you look yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, the, the really hardcore extremist Catholics go after her every time she the most recent thing was she posted something about this picture of a guy doing heroin on the subway and i think she basically said stop making fun of him it's not so bad if that like the 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 worst part of the picture is not that he's doing it in public it's that like there's institutional failure or whatever and the yeah. the catholics were like oh, liz brunick said she doesn't care if people do heroin on the subway oh my god and as if that's like some big own and mm -hmm. all of their fo like all of their followers are like crowing like it is some kind of big own and i don't really get it um i guess they they have a big stick up their ass about morality and in in ways that it like must be performed it's very interesting mm -hmm. like there's a performative aspect to their morality you have to point out the morally bad thing always mm -hmm. or you have done a sin Mm -hmm. yes. Which seems so very anti-Jesus like Who is basically the guy who invented chillness God gave well, his only son to earth In order to get, get people real he chill He points out sins He was yeah. he, he would point it out I mean, he, But he also says to, You have to take in, under consideration Your own sinfulness before you do so um, mm -hmm. And so, you know What was special about Jesus Was that he was man so sort of born with original sin in some way but he was also god so it's very interesting uh i suggest you research it um but don't get sucked down the rabbit hole yeah we're not well we're not anti-religious here uh we we both probably were did you ever go through like a new atheism phase um i kind like kind of i like I think uh, my dad gave me an article by Sam Harris that like the one that made him kind of famous like 15 or 20 years ago. Um, yeah. And I remember I, I remember because I was a I went through an atheism phase at Catholic school where I was uh, yeah. called the atheist. I was bullied for being an atheist. <laughs> I had teachers like pull me aside and like interrogate me about my personal relationship with God and, <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. So when, you know, when Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris were going off, I was kind of like, yeah, I, I I've lived it, brother. I've, mm -hmm. I've been through it. So I yes. know. Um, so I didn't really have to, you know, I was never like a Reddit a R atheism guy. Uh, yeah. Cause I kind of just stopped caring about that stuff when I got to college. Cause I found out about yeah. girls and alcohol. And that's what I wanted to do. Also, <laughs> you get out in the real world and you meet a bunch of real people and you realize that most religious people are basically just grill pilled and like God gives them, you know, peace when they think about, you know, their loved ones dying. And that's pretty much it. And they just want to grill, which is, you know, no, when you grow I up mean, in like I a... don't want to sell it. I don't want to necessarily endorse that because they can be pretty oppressive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I okay, most is the wrong term, but there's a lot of very normal religious people out there that yeah. whose religion does not cause them to be oppressive. Where, but there, in the same breath, there are plenty of religious people who do oppress because of their religion. So what do you, what do you make of uh, the recent stuff with Liz? So the article I get that got everyone mad was her saying, I liked being a mom at 25. Oh, well, that just came is, out today. Yeah. Wow. But now that has people like cursing her name and saying that you're encouraging everyone to be child brides. How dare or you're, you're being discriminatory against people that have children later. That's funny. And that's funny because like yeah. one of the hardcore uh, right wing Catholic fascists was like, you can discount Liz Burnett because she's basically a child bride. <laughs> <laughs> that's fucked up yes. uh, there, I mean the story of like Matt rescuing her from her abusive uh, family is, is sort of beautiful and incredible uh, I, I just don't understand what uh, why people hate I, I guess it's it seems to me just evident jealousy oh 
these people are obviously soulmates and they both do good work together and uh they have an enviable life and they point out good i mean like liz doesn't they they're not all zingers you know sometimes she pose ills but more often than not it's uh it's good stuff and it's real compassionate stuff written with a real sense of humanity and yeah i mean uh, there's a lot of benefits to having a child early a lot mm -hmm. Uh, yeah like well i mean especially just having the energy to keep up with them too yeah it's gonna you're gonna have an easier time um mm -hmm. the, the sooner the better basically mm -hmm. well you got it that sweet spot you're you know your mid-20s is it if, if you have the money uh very good even if you don't have the money i mean that's not probably shouldn't have children if you don't have the money no, but i would can. never chastise a person it's for fine. doing that because that happens every day yeah no it's fine i mean they don't need that much. They're not that expensive until later. When they're... Yeah, until college, baby. Yeah, I mean, it's really not that expensive. It's hyped up how expensive it is, I think. Um, at mm. first, it's not that bad. It gets worse as they get older and they need more stuff. You have to buy them mm -hmm. stuff. And then you need to have them. Get them all if you, you feel bad if they can't play outside. So yeah. try to have the nice <laughs> house. But, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know. I thought the, I knew that article was going to push people's buttons. I didn't actually read it all the way through because I found it boring. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, because it's totally anodyne. There's no, there shouldn't be any controversy in it. But people are like, this is controversial because it's Liz saying it. So she must have some agenda. Yeah. You know, talk about conspiratorial mindset. Like the right wing people think she's an op against Catholicism. And the left wing people think she's an op against, you know, uh, uh, against anti-traditionalism it's you know? crazy they like bring up the fact that her dad was like an accountant for some company that did something with the yeah but she hates her dad and is totally estranged from her dad i i don't understand why people bring that well, up there's this as tendency to like that's so it, i hate it because there's this ability like what they'll do is they'll find out like oh your great grandfather was a capitalist and then you're yeah. kicked out of the movement or canceled or whatever and like it's it's very strange yeah, it's literally sins of the father it's it's this hardcore purity christianity well, it's, thing it's which they a don't part do. of her identity that she had no control over and to attack someone because of who they are is just wrong just wrong, it's just baby. Wrong. Done it. Uh, well, people used it when the socialism done left person fucked up. Uh, they found out that their uh, grandfather had FBI or CIA ties, and it's just you know, it's I I think yeah, it's that op mind. It's that everything is an op mindset um, that really makes makes people make poor decisions and criticize people not on the merits of their ideas but just on tangential shit which always undermines your argument and it always makes you look stupid and bad. Um, and I do it all the time. So I'm not saying I'm above that, uh, but I'm just saying I always, it always makes me look dumb when I do that and I should do it less. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just going through her mentions now looking for all the men, people who are mentioning her and she's taking it mm -hmm. from all sides. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just, uh, yeah, and it's weird because she has this totally unassuming, friendly persona, and people take it as so aggressive, which is what I think is funny to me. Like, people interpret her opinions as this aggro shit, which I don't understand. I don't know. Um, but I think you said it once, is that the reason why people hate Liz Brunig is because she's kind of Twitter's mom, yeah. and some people really hate their mom. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's pe the people who have mom problems just take it out on her yeah. i hate you i hate yeah, you either for exposing like a relationship with their mother that they didn't have or um for you know uh, potentially creating this normative idea of motherhood but yeah i i think i guess if there was any theme of this episode just the three stories we covered with black hammer uh bill gates and epstein and and liz brunig is that this everything is an op mindset is stupid and mm -hmm. we need to, like, yes, there are things, there are secrets that you will never be privy to, but it's sort of easier, it's a lot easier to conceptualize the world when you anticipate that people are, are doing it for genuinely personal motivations, and there's no shadowy conspiracy controlling everything all the time. Maybe some of the time, 
but not all the time. And you have to get rid of that. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Tune in next week for another episode of House of Decline. Bye.